بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أب القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله اما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين اتخذوا مسجدا ضرارا وكفرا وتفريقا بين المؤمنين وارصادا لمن حارب الله ورسوله من قبل the first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The second louder salawat in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. A third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa al-Zaman. <laughs> Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. The verse in question, verse 107 of Surah 9 of the Holy Quran, discusses one of the most harmful and poisonous mosques in the history of the religion. This mosque was a mosque that was built in Medina and was a mosque that had to be destroyed due to the fact that the intention upon the building of this mosque was to destroy the very fabric of the religion of Islam. A mosque can either make or break a community. Some mosques are built on hypocrisy. Other mosques are built on piety. Some mosques are built to try and destroy the ummah. Other mosques are built to unite the ummah. And therefore you find that the mosque occupies a prominent position in the lives of many Muslims, as in those who are blessed to have been brought up in a mosque, where they learn the very principles and the ethics of the religion of Islam, will realize that the mosque had a major bearing on their life, will realize that the mosque had a major bearing on their principles and the way they interacted with others. Who you listen to in a mosque, who leads the mosque, the example of the leaders of the mosque, all of these are vital components in building a healthy Muslim society. Because since the religion of Islam began, the mosque has always been the center of congregation. At one stage or another, you'll see that a Muslim will congregate within the mosque, will either be at the mosque for Friday prayers, will be at the mosque for their wedding, will be at the mosque for a funeral, will be at the mosque for majalis and different congregations. Mosques you will find in many different parts of the world. In North Africa, you have some of the oldest mosques. In China, you have some of the oldest mosques. In the Middle East, you have some of the oldest mosques. Yet you find, unfortunately, there is seemingly a lack of relationship between the Muslims today and their mosques. And one of the reasons is because of the fact that many Muslims have become disenchanted with the mosque. As in when you ask many Muslims, do you enjoy going to your mosque? They reply that I don't want to go there anymore. The mosque is full of hypocrites, full of backbiters, and the leaders of the mosques do not understand the needs of us because the leaders of the mosques do not realize what we are facing in our life. In many cases, the khutbas in the mosques are khutbas which are not related to our lives. And likewise, you cannot go to a mosque in the Muslim world but that you would have found that within the mosque there is disunity amongst the community. You'll find that one Mawlana despises another Mawlana. You'll find that one group hates another group. You'll find that this mosque will never enter that mosque and that mosque will never enter this mosque. 
And always behind all of this is Muslims, not non-Muslims. As in many times, Muslims love to blame non-Muslims as to why we have problems in our communities. The reality is a lot of it is our own arrogance and ignorance. But at the same time, there is no doubt that we have to be careful that our mosques do not empty out and become freehold residential buildings for sale like many churches have become, yes. When you look at many churches in the world today, they're freehold developments which people can buy. If you want to convert the church into a set of flats or a set of condominiums, they'll allow you because the Christian religion realized that because of the internal conflicts that were there between the members of the community, many of the Christians turned around and said that we're not interested in coming to a mosque that builds division. I want to come to a mosque that brings us together that accepts plurality of opinions in theology, plurality of opinions in law, plurality of opinions in ethics, plurality of opinions in mysticism and spirituality. I don't want to come to a mosque where anyone who disagrees with me, automatically I hate them and they hate me. Because at the end of the day, the Quran says, Al-Masajid Lillah, yes, the mosques are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, None of them are mine and your property. There's no mosque on this earth that belongs to you. Yes, you may claim to be a guide for the people of the mosque. Yes, there may be, for example, a resident alim in the mosque who can guide. But how many resident alims guide with sincerity and not a political agenda? You therefore find that when you come to the mosque that we live in today, there is a major question mark as to whether the mosques are actually doing what the Prophet envisaged with his mosque in Medina. Why? Because when you look at the mosque of the Prophet in Medina, was it just a place for lectures and salah? Or was it something more? As in today, you'll find that many of the youth, when you ask them, do you enjoy coming mosque? They'll say, no, I don't enjoy. Say, why? Say, all we do there is pray and we hear lectures. There's nothing which builds my physical life, nothing which builds my social life. Nothing which builds my educational life. Yes, a lecture for 45 minutes. But how many times are we going to come in Muharram and Shahar Ramadan? If you ask many of the followers of Al Muhammad, when was the last time they come to the mosque before Muharram? I guarantee you, you'll have a good percentage who'll say Shahar Ramadan. And if you ask many who are coming in Shahar Ramadan, when was the last time you came before Shahar Ramadan? Many will say to you, Muharram. As in you find therefore that there is a major issue let alone the number of mosques who are led by people who I refer to as the lovers of Ayat al-Kursi. Ayat al-Kursi, when you translate it in English, is what? The lovers of the verse of the chair. No one loves getting off the chair of that mosque once they've got it. There are many who are in charge of mosques. Wallah, he will not move from that mosque. He will sit on that chair. You say to him, but there's a younger generation that's coming through. Why don't you give the keys to the mosque if you can't organize programs, then give it to the younger generation? You'll find that many of them will turn around and say, no, my grandfather led this mosque and his grandfather led this mosque and the family will continue to lead this mosque until you dig yourself a grave into the ground. And then we've got a new situation with our mosques, which is what? The mosques which openly want to cause disunity between the ummah. Yes, you've now got a new group of mosques whose sole role the whole year is to attack other Muslims. That's it, nothing else. No philanthropy, no charitable work, no helping on medical issues, no looking out for orphans. The whole agenda is how can I attack the companions of Rasulullah? How can I attack the wives of Rasulullah? Peace be upon him and his family. And how can I make sure that I even attack the fellow followers of Al Muhammad? Yes? As in, how can I make sure that I build a mosque which attacks the fellow followers of Ahlul Bayt? That's the sole agenda. Therefore, the issue of the position of the mosque in the 21st century becomes fundamental. Because I never want to reach a day where this particular building says freehold residential development for sale. Those who want to come and buy can buy. It could be a reality. If Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al kadhim Imam al-Rabbah's wiladats have 10 people, and Imam al Hussein's majalis have a thousand in them. This doesn't show that we are progressing. Yes. Abu Abdullah, anyone can turn up for his majlis. But not everyone can turn up for Imam al Kadhim, Imam al Rada. Does that mean that we need to reform the institution of the mosque? Does that mean we have to revamp the institution of the mosque? 
Because we know very well three things will complain on the day of judgment. One of them is what? Is the mosque that was abandoned by its followers. But when the followers abandon a mosque, it's not because we don't want to come to the mosque. Sometimes it's because the mosque is not catering for the needs of the followers. Therefore tonight I'd like to examine this wonderful incident in the Quran known as the incident of Masjid Dirar, the mosque of harm. Can a mosque be a harmful mosque? Aren't all mosques the houses of Allah and all of them beneficial? Let's look at this particular story in the Quran and highlight how from being a mosque for supposedly the poor, it turned out to be the mosque that wanted to destroy the religion of Islam. I'd like to examine this in the following stages. Which monk and which hypocrite were behind the building of the mosque in Medina? And why were they so jealous of the Holy Prophet? And how does it highlight to us the jealousy that exists between religious figures in religion? Number two, what did Allah order the Prophet to do with that mosque? And in Islam, can a Muslim destroy a mosque? And what do the hadith say about the 12th Imam when he returns? How many mosques will he destroy by himself? Number three, and of the utmost importance, when the mosque in Medina was built of the Holy Prophet, was it a place just for namaz and just for lectures? Or was it a social civic center for the whole community? And how should our mosques go towards that direction? Number four, should a mosque only invite Muslims or should non-Muslims be allowed into the mosque? Should a mosque only invite speakers who they agree with? or even speakers who differ with them. Number five, what are the other examples of mosques that are built in the Muslim world today that can be taken as role models for our mosques? And how important is it for us to take them as an example? And number six, which five mosques in Islam can you have the option of praying full even if you're traveling for a short period in that area? And which one of them has Muslim bin Aqil buried within it? Let's examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. When I grew up, my parents kept on telling me every mosque is the house of Allah and there can never be a mosque that's harmful until I read Surah At-Tawbah. Surah At-Tawbah highlights to you that not every mosque that is built is necessarily a place for the unity and for the good of the Muslim Ummah. Some of us may turn around and ask the question that that's impossible when a mosque is built, a mosque has salah within it, has dua within it, has people who are trying to understand the religion within it. Surely, therefore, every single mosque is to be revered. No, not at all. That mosque was built by two men who had jealousy of the Prophet Muhammad, but built a mosque to hide their jealousy. Because what's better for a leader? The more money I give to a mosque, the more I can have my own agenda in that mosque. Correct? You'll find that this one of them was a monk by the name of Abu Amr. And a second was a hypocrite by the name of Abdullah bin Ubay. Abu Amr was a monk. Some say from the tribe of Aus, some say from the tribe of Khazraj. The historians differ. This man was very famous in Medina. He was a Christian, a pious man. Never ever got in trouble, never got in the way of anyone. He was a respectable person, a person of dignity. And this person had envisaged that one day that he would be what? The governor of Medina. When the Prophet Muhammad migrated from Mecca to Medina, what happened was as soon as the Prophet Muhammad migrated, the people of Medina took him as their leader. When the people of Medina took him as their leader, this monk was angry. How could you people take Muhammad as your leader when I have lived amongst you, when I have been here? I've never caused any problems for you. The people of Medina replied, but the Prophet Muhammad brought Islam as that we have no disrespect for Christianity, but we want Islam to be the official state religion. This person turned around and his envy overtook him. Who was the person who he found as his supporter? Abdullah bin Ubay. Abdullah bin Ubay was one of the people who also envisaged that he could be governor of Medina. Abdullah bin Ubay kept on telling people, one day I'm going to be your governor. One day, one day, the Prophet Muhammad came, he became governor of Medina. These two got together and said, listen, Muhammad's taken all of our opportunities. You, Abu Amr, was going to be governor of Medina. You, Abdullah bin Ubay, was going to be governor of Medina. 
How are we going to remove Muhammad? What was the first thing they chose? The first thing they decided in the way they were going to remove the Prophet Muhammad was by what? Let's help the opposition and Abu Sufyan on the day of Uhud. How? Abdullah bin Ubay publicly was a Muslim. But subhanallah, some publicly are so pure and their heart is full of malice to the Muslims. You find that this Abdullah bin Ubay publicly, he was a wonderful person. He was going behind the back telling Abu Sufyan how to enter Medina. Abu Amr joined Abu Sufyan. He would even dig the holes. There's one hadith that mentions Rasulullah was walking in Uhud and there was a hole there. He fell and broke one of his teeth when he fell into that hole. This Abu Amr was digging the hole that was there. He was digging. What was his intention? That we're going to kill Muhammad. Muhammad is not going to have a chance against us today. That day on the day of Uhud, the Muslims did not perform as expected. Yes, many of the companions had run away on that day. The Quran mentions, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرَّسُولٌ أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ Muhammad is but a messenger and messengers have come before him. If he dies or rather he is killed, you turn back on your heels. As the new people claim to be his best friends, how could you run away and leave him like that? If my best friend, there's a scuff happening outside and my best friend does a runner to the local McDonald's, then that best friend of mine, I have to think twice whether this is my best friend or no, because I'd expect my friend to be on my side. You found that the Quran mentioned they ran away, but the Prophet managed to hold his own on that day. Abu Amr couldn't believe it, that number one, Muhammad's the governor. Number two, 4,000 soldiers of Abu Sufyan, again, 750 of the Prophet Muhammad, and they still came through. Number three, his son was who? His son was Hanwala. Hamwala, his son had converted to the religion of Islam. Imagine. Firstly, you lose your governorship. Secondly, Islam's getting powerful. Thirdly, your son tells you, Dad, the Prophet Muhammad's morals are enough for me to believe that he's the final messenger of God. I'm going to leave Christianity not because I believe Jesus is wrong, but I believe Muhammad is an extension of Christ's message. See, this is a wonderful line. Jesus never brought a message we disagree with. All we say is that the Prophet Muhammad is the extension of that message. If Moses brought law and Jesus brought the spirit of law, Muhammad brought the fusion of spirit and law together. When Hanbala left, Hanbala went where? Hanbala went towards Islam. Abdullah bin Ubay's daughter, what was her name? Jamila. She converted to the religion of Islam. Imagine these two, how angry they've become. Both of them thought they're going to rule. Imagine you're going to be mayor. There's someone who takes your position as mayor. Not just they take your position. Your children vote for that person. Hanbala, son of Abu Amr, became Muslim. Jamila, daughter of Abdullah bin Ubay, became Muslim. What do they then decide to do? Get married to each other. <laughs> Subhanallah. Now you've got the two governors who wanted to be governors of Medina. Abdullah bin Ubay, his daughter Jamila. Abu Amr, his son Hanbala convert to Islam and become Muslims and get married to each other. And those of you who've read the famous hadiths about Hanbala being what? Ghasil al-Malaika. When he died in battle and he had just been with his wife the night before and his wife was wondering, is my husband there in Jannah? And the Prophet said to her, your husband is being given ghusl by the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore you found that when this all took place, Abu Amr and Abdullah bin Ubay asked themselves a question. How do we finish Muhammad? Sometimes the best way to finish a religion is by coming from without into the religion. Yes. Cause disunity externally or cause disunity internally. I remember once there was a feed on Twitter on a side note where someone was attacking me on Twitter. Said Amman, you know, you get the usual attacks every Muharram. And so he was attacking, 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 and they linked him back to a particular account of whom? He had put his account as what? Hussein bin Ali, because everyone would think that this person's one of our community. And they linked him all the way back to being the community of an extreme group of Muslims. I don't need to mention their names. Our people jumped on that Twitter. Yes, I agree with you. Yes, he's like that. This is one Wahhabi managed to fall all of you, mashallah. Now, so what happened with this person is that this person what did he do? He thought to himself, what's the best way to destroy? 
So you know what he said? Let's build a mosque. Who's going to ever think we can destroy Islam through the building of a mosque? Abu Amr looked at Abdullah bin Ubay. He said, we'll build a mosque. And we'll say the mosque is for the weak and the poor of Medina. So you disguise it wonderfully. I'm a philanthropic, charitable person who's come here to give you barakah. And I want to build all of you a mosque. And we'll place the mosque next to Masjid Qiba. Those who have been to Umrah or Hajj will know that mosque in Medina we call Masjid Qiba. Many of us go on the outside ziyara. We go towards Uhud and then we go Masjid Qiba, Masjid Shajara and the other mosques. He said that I'm going to build the mosque where? Next to Masjid Qiba. Now Masjid Qiba was a wonderful mosque. It was the Quran says about it built on taqwa. Because when a mosque is built on taqwa, you'll see barakah in that mosque forever. Yes. That mosque was built on taqwa. That was the mosque where the Holy Prophet, when he entered Medina first, prayed, waited for Imam Amir al muminin until Imam Amir al muminin came on the night of Hijrah when he left with the Fawatim. That mosque was there. Where better to put a mosque than next to that mosque? Why? Because next to that mosque, firstly, you can find out what's going on in that mosque. Secondly, you could say for those who it's difficult for them to reach there, there's a mosque for them to use our facilities as well, yes? These two got together, they built the mosque. Now, what do you need when you build a mosque? You need the main man of the religion to cut the ribbon. Do you agree? So they came to the Prophet. They said to him, we'd be delighted if you'd pray two ruk'ah in our mosque. The Holy Prophet turned around. He said to them, I'm on the way to the battle of Tabuk. You know, there's a battle in Islam, famous battle, where no fighting took place in reality, but it's called the battle of Tabuk. He said that I'm on my way to Tabuk. Abdullah bin Amr or Abu Amr, he had gone where? He had gone to Heraclius, the Roman emperor. He had said to him, you want Muhammad finished? He said, yes. He said, I've got the best way to finish him. He said, what? He said, send me weapons. I'll build a mosque. In that mosque, we will put weapons in the basement. When Muhammad and his soldiers come in, we'll kill them. Or when they're away on war, we'll ambush everybody who's there. When Muhammad's outside Medina, and that's why the only battle Ali ibn Abi Talib did not attend with Rasulullah was which one? Tabuk. Every other battle Ali ibn Abi Talib attended with the Prophet except Tabuk. Some will say Khaybar. Khaybar, he was ill and the Prophet called him. Tabuk is the only one. And you know the famous hadith, Oh Ali, you are to me like Harun was to Musa. When Imam Ali says to him, Ya Rasulullah, I am not coming with you on Tabuk. Is there an issue? Is there a, a problem that I have done or caused? And he said to him, Ali, you are to me like Harun was to Musa. Except there is no prophet after me. The only difference between us, I am a prophet, you're an imam. Otherwise, you see what I see and you hear what I hear. Yes? Imam Ali had stayed behind. These people had built this wonderful mosque, which if you walk past it, you'll say, MashaAllah, amazing mosque and so on. A mosque is not in the beauty on the outside. It's on the souls that walk in the inside. Yes. When these people built this mosque, the Prophet gone to Tabuk. The Prophet said to them, Inshallah, when I return, if Allah wills. And that's a wonderful line for Rasulullah because he gets an email from Allah and like us. When a Muslim says to you, Inshallah, you can forget about the issue. Rasulullah, if he says to you, Inshallah, then there is a possibility that if Allah writes him an email which says to him, go to the mosque, you go. But this time, the email that came in the Quran was an email telling him, do not go towards that mosque. Why? Because the ayah in the Quran is so explicit about the intention of that mosque and what it was aiming to do. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مَسْجِدًا ضِرَارًا وَكُفْرًا وَتَفْرِيقًا بَيْنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَإِرْصَادًا لِمَنْ حَارَبَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ مِنْ قَابْلَ Listen to what it says. And those who took for themselves a mosque full of harm. Principle number one. If a mosque is built where the intention is to harm, then that mosque is not part of the religion of Islam. Yes? In Islam, those who have studied Usul al-Fiqh will know there is a principle that remains one of the most important principles. And that is, the religion of Islam does not occasion harm. Islamic law does not occasion harm. The principles of the religion built on the idea that there's an incident where Samara bin Jundub, one of the companions of the Prophet, purposely would, uh, he sold the house, there was a tree in the back garden, he wouldn't sell the tree. 
And he wants to come to this tree and visit. Baba, you sold your house. Leave the tree. You've sold me the house. So I know I want to come and visit my tree. People have relations with trees and so on. And he wants to come and visit the tree, visit the tree, until Rasulullah ordered, cut that tree down. Normally in Islam, you can't cut a tree down. Unless what? Unless it occasions harm for the people or for the public of that area. If you have a tree outside your house now, and that tree, there's a chance it's going to fall on the neighbor's window. You can't turn around and say, it's haram for me um, to kill, uh, you know, to cut down that tree. Uh, because I will harm the environment. Habibi, our environment, you've got a human being's baby is about to die because of that tree falling on them. Yes? Islam does not occasion harm. La dharar wa la dharar is a principle in fiqh. And this ayah is where the words come from. Walladheena takhadu masjidan dhararan. A mosque that is built to harm, not just harm. Wa kufran, built on disbelief and causing disbelief. وَتَفْرِيقًا بَيْنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Number three, a mosque in Islam can never be a mosque whose intention is to cause disunity between the believers, yes. If I build a mosque, or I'm the management committee of a mosque, or I'm the leadership of a mosque, if it's my intention to be part of the disunity between the lovers of Ahlul Bayt, then that mosque should be destroyed and that committee should be removed. Why? Because this is on the principle of this ayah. The ayah didn't say to the Prophet, don't go to the mosque. No. There are those who build harmful mosques. These mosques are mosques of disbelief because they cause disunity between the mu'mineen. Nothing in Islam is as important as unity between the lovers of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhima. Lovers of Muhammad and Al Muhammad's unity comes first. What is it? Tafriqan bayn al mu'mineen. Today, someone says Shia Sunni unity. I say, Habibi, find me Shia Shia unity first. Yes. This mosque represents that marja. This mosque represents that marja. You've come to honor 14 masumin or you've come to honor fallible humans. Yes. Why do you know more about a fallible than you know about Imam al Jawad? Why do you know more about a fallible than you know about Imam al kadhim Why do you know about a mystical fallible person in Qom, a fallible mystic, and you don't know about Uwais al-Qarani and Maytham al-Tammar and Kumail bin Ziyad, yes? You who come and tell me Shia Sunni unity first, Shia, Shia unity, yes? When you build a mosque and you actively make it clear, we follow the following marja, and that anyone who does not follow our marja should not be in our mosque, then you are causing a mosque that's full of harm. Because I don't come to a mosque on the basis of which marja you follow, or which city you come from. I come to a mosque on the basis of whether you remind me of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhima. Go to London today, you'll find mosques which are built on the basis of which scholar they follow. For years, their own people would not visit each other. Go to Birmingham, go to Bradford, go to Manchester. I guarantee you, go to all of these places, you'll find mosques where people don't come to each other to visit each other. Say, why? You built that mosque, Maulana. You and your committee, when you built a mosque. You built a mosque, so what? So that we disunite between the mu'mineen or we unite? As in, you want to call for Shia Sunni unity, I'm all for it. But first, let the mosques bring Shia Shia unity amongst each other. When every year in Muharram, you see one mosque speaker attack the speaker of another mosque. They are this, they are this, they are this. Who, who are you to tell me who is who? At the other day, someone comes from Majlis al Hussein, that's it, leave it to Imam al Hussein, not to me. Someone comes to a Majlis. You don't base a majlis depending on which marja you follow or which country you follow. Therefore, the Quran said what? That that mosque was a mosque of harm. It told the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, a mosque is a mosque of harm. When it is encouraging disbelief, disunity between the Muslims and the mu'mineen in particular, وَإِرْصَادًا لِمَنْ حَارَبَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ And it provides a place for those who want to wage war against Allah and his prophet, yes? Believe you me, why was that mosque destroyed? You know one of the hadiths mentions, they burned the mosque down, not destroyed it. 
Someone says, in Islam, can a Muslim, according to Islamic law, destroy a mosque? Of course, a Muslim can destroy a mosque. Of course you can. And that's why if you read the literature on the 12th Imam, you see one of his duties when he returns is to destroy mosques. Someone says, what? I thought Dajjal, Sufyani, Yamani, Dajjal, and all of these, everyone's involved in all of this, and everyone's trying to get to know one another. No, 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 no. First, there are mosques within the religion that need to be destroyed. Why? Because those mosques, when you look at their leaders, what's their main role? The leader's main role is to cause trouble and fitna in that community. And so why do you build a mosque in London to cause fitna, for example? Why don't you go to Iraq? Why don't you go to Iran? Why don't you go to Pakistan? Why in this country? This country full of open-minded people, tolerant people. Our intellect is much higher than the filth that you bring, yes? Why in this country you want to build a mosque of fitna? We were living happily, all of us together, Muslims amongst each other. All of a sudden, I will make a television channel. And that television channel, what's the main aim? To cause disunity between the Ummah, yes? And believe you me, it's not one television channel. It's not one. Just in case someone now comes to me and says that you spoke about one television channel. Majority of the channels of the Shia of Al Muhammad are channels which are all based on groupies and sides and whose marja they follow. I will be very clear. Believe you me, I, I myself, many of you know, there are channels that do not broadcast my lectures. Yes? And I don't really care, at the end of the day, there's no greater channel than YouTube. But there are channels that do not broadcast my lectures. Let's be clear. Now they are channels from Ahlul Sunnah. No, Wallah, our Ahlul Sunnah brothers, what have they done wrong? Let them continue. They are channels from the Wahhabi or the Salafi. No, no, no. Our own, our own channels. Say why? Say because we differ on an opinion. Therefore, you shouldn't be on our channel. You've ever studied Mufid and Saduq's differences? Oh no. You've studied the differences between different ulama in the medieval period? Oh, well, you haven't studied their differences, or you have. But subhanAllah, what happened with Abu Amr and Abdullah bin Ubay? What happened? Jealousy and envy destroyed. And what do you think happens between the mosques today? A mosque which is built to disunite is all based on jealousy of people who lead the mosque. I tell you, nothing further than that, jealousy. They'll tell you it's my concern for the community. No, 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 it's not your concern. If you're not a master in this area, stay away from concern of the community. Jealousy therefore exists between these mosques and the Quran mentioned that such mosques, I don't care if there's la ilaha illallah in them. Muhammad, burn that mosque. Burn? What do you mean burn? Allah's name is in it. This is they're using Allah's name to create fitna. Burn the mosque, put it to shreds. Some said they came and destroyed the mosque. Whatever it was in Islam, if a mosque is built with the intention of disuniting the mu'mineen, then that mosque is, becomes a mosque which is harmful. Question, therefore, when the Prophet built his mosque in Medina, was that mosque, what was it built on? Just salah, because I tell you, we will lose our congregation, not just youth, by the way. There are many elders, including people of my own family. If you ask them, are you going to the mosque? What do you mean I'm going to the mosque? What am I going to gain? Yes. What am I going to gain in the mosque? I'll sit at home, watch TV, There's majlis on TV, for example. I'm not going to turn up to the mosque. The Prophet realized if a mosque is just about lectures and namaz, no one's going to come. If a mosque is just lectures and namaz, no one will come. That's why his mosque in Medina was a civic center for society, not just a place of worship. Because a true place of worship is a place which is what? A place which is open to helping the human holistically, Socially, economically, medically, politically, every area of the life. When my son wants to come to a mosque, I always remind him the mosque of Medina. Why? Let's look at the mosque of Medina and look at the difference in the mosques today. And I hope we use these to evolve our mosques. Firstly, the mosque in Medina, you wanted to get married, you came to the mosque. You didn't have to go elsewhere. Yes, you come to the mosque. Someone says, what do you mean I used to come to the mosque? Today, you know how many youths we have? Wonderful brothers and sisters who should be married. But nobody in the mosque has made a matchmaking room for them to come and get married. You found Aqil, brother of Imam Ali, used to put a carpet outside uh, on, the, on the ground. He used to place a carpet, he used to sit there. People would come up to him and ask him, I want to get married to someone, I don't know about their genealogies. Could you tell me about the family back? You know, like a reference for marriage. 
Aqil would sit there, whenever you ask him a question, he would answer it. How do you think Imam Ali got married to Umm al-Banin? How? Imam Ali got married to Umm al-Banin on the basis that he came to his brother Aqil. He sat with him. He said, my brother, I'm looking for a lady whose lineage is the greatest of lineages. Imam Aqil said to him, come back to me in one month. Imam Ali doesn't know how to get married. You, I ask you a question. Imam Ali doesn't know how to find a wife. Ali ibn Abi Talib knows the secrets of the heavens. You think he doesn't know the secrets of the earth? Why did he insist on asking his brother to show matchmaking is fundamental in the mosque? Fundamental. Don't come to me later and say to me, why is my daughter married outside the community? You deserve the leaders you have because of your silence and allowing them to lead. Just let me be clear. If you now, the youth, are complaining that there's nothing in the mosque. Okay, there's nothing because you guys, it could be a case that you're not turning up to the mosque, you're not speaking in the mosque, you're not volunteering in the mosque. If you volunteer and speak, then the leaders of the mosque will help change. First thing in the Prophet's mosque, you want to get married, you come to the mosque. I don't need to find my wife in a McDonald's or a Burger King or something like that. However romantic those places are. Yes, I can come to the mosque and I come to the mosque and I see someone who's a matchmaker. And do you know how much thawab a matchmaker has? MashaAllah. The number of hadiths that mention the matchmaker in the highest of ways. You bring two people in union to get closer to half of their deen. What other thawab do you want? Therefore, number one, a place for marriage. Number two, a place for the poor. Abu Huraira, many of you know. Abu Huraira, famous companion of the Prophet and narrator of the most hadiths according to our brothers in Ahl Sunnah that he had known the Prophet for three years approximately and he narrated about five and a half thousand hadith. Ali ibn Abi Talib knew the Prophet for 33 and narrates about 17. Abu Huraira, famous companion of Rasulullah, you know originally where Abu Huraira used to sleep? The mosque of Rasulullah was a place for the homeless. If you were homeless, they'd find you a place in the mosque. Abu Huraira used to sleep on this ledge. It was called Suffa. In Arabic, a Suffa is a ledge. Ashab Suffa are the companions who used to have a kip. Where? On the ledge. These companions would have a sleep there on the ledge. And these companions would sleep. He used to be very clever. Why? He used to wait for Ja'far al-Tayyar, Ja'far, Imam Ali's brother. All you had to do is ask him a question and he wouldn't answer it. He'll say, listen, come home, let's have some food. So Abu Huraira would ask him questions so that he gets an invite home for food. Yes. You know, there are certain people in our communities, the famous ones who tell you, come home, come home. You've, there's always one person in the community. He'll say to you, come home for food. You're like, Baba, wallah, I have a home. No, no, come home, come home, come home. No, no, I came home last week. Come home. Ja'far al-Tayyar was known like that. Abu Huraira would see Ja'far al-Tayyar. He'd say to him, uh, you know, I've got a question for you. Ja'far al-Tayyar said, what's the question? Some mention Abdullah bin Ja'far even. He would ask him, listen, come home. I will answer it. Alhamdulillah, you know, I'm going to go and eat somewhere. But for Abu Huraira, he was amongst the class of companions who were known as the homeless companions, the poor companions. Did the Prophet Muhammad say this house is not for the homeless? The house of Allah never closes for everybody. The house of Allah is open for everybody. The companions who were homeless would come and sleep on the ledge. Or if they were poor, no food, they would sleep there on the ledge. Ask yourselves in the followers of Ahlul Bayt in our mosques, how many of us have got places for the homeless or can guide the homeless towards shelter? If my mosque cannot provide a place for shelter, have I got a hotline for shelter? Have I built an old people's nursing home, which I've dedicated, that's people who come who need shelter? In there, there is a Quran, there is a book on Ahl al-Bayt, there are things which people can learn. That homeless person does not deserve to be out there in the street abandoned in this way. Rasulullah did not say it's a place for salah, no. That ledge, wherever there's someone who's homeless, come sleep on that ledge, and there'll be a member of the Muslim community who'll sponsor you, number two. Number three, a place for interfaith dialogue. Many times, people will say to you that a mosque, non-Muslims cannot be there in the mosque. Do you agree? We were taught that if a non-Muslim comes to a mosque, then that non-Muslim can be in the Imam Barga area, but not in the Masjid or Musalla area. Then how did the Christians discuss with Rasulullah about Mubahala? How? Where were they? With a microphone outside the mosque saying, we will debate you outside with a microphone. And these are our points. 
Is that how the Christians debated Rasulullah? As in sometimes I wonder the narrow-mindedness of the followers of the religion is far away from the open-mindedness of the men who brought the religion to us. Yes. Mubahala, these people came in the mosque of Rasulullah. The hadiths are clear. They entered the mosque of the Prophet Muhammad. If it's haram for a non-Muslim to enter the mosque, then why did not Rasulullah kick them out? Or Imam Ali say, get out, you can't be in a mosque. There's no narration where Imam Ali says that you are a non-Muslim, you cannot be in the mosque. Yes! You know, one may argue the mushrik and the clear demarcation with shirk is seen with Masjid al-Haram. Yes? The house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to say that all non-Muslims are not allowed to enter the mosque on the contrary, then how will they learn about Islam? You tell me. How will they learn? At the end of the day, don't I want to propagate the message? How will they learn? Interfaith dialogue in this time is fundamental because the misconceptions of this religion are killing the soul of this religion. Wallah. Wallah are killing the soul. And I'm coming to that majlis very soon about saving the soul of this religion. The soul of this religion is being killed. And unless we sit with the Christians and the Jews and the Hindus and the Sikhs and the atheists and the Buddhists, then we will not be able to peacefully coexist. So many people do not know about Ahlul Bayt's ethics, Ahlul Bayt's principles, Ahlul Bayt's spirituality. All they know about is what? Suicide bomb, terrorism, suicide bomb, burning, terrorism, nothing else. Whereas you find clearly that within the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, interfaith dialogue, and the Quran mentions, Ya Ahl al Kitab, Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'in bainana wa bainakum. Allah na'abuda illa Allah wa la nushrik bi shay'a wa la yattakhid ba'duna ba'dan arbaaban min dun Allah. O people of the book, come to a joint word. Do you, know, do you know, notice it says, O people of the book? Doesn't say, O people of the books. Ya Ahl al Kitab. Doesn't say, Ya Ahl al Kutub, for example. O people of the book. Why did Allah mention the plural? They've got Torah, Injil, Quran. Well, that's three books. Why say, oh, people of the book? Why, three, why not say, oh, people of the books? Because ultimately all of their books come from one main center point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. It's as if even in that ayah Allah wanted to highlight, there's more commonalities in you than there are differences. I don't even want to see your books separated. I'd rather all of you remember there's one book and that's with me. And I expect all of you to return back to that one true word of mine. Interfaith dialogue. Bring them to the mosque. The mosque shouldn't be closed. Today in Muharram, I look around the majlis. I see some of our brothers from the Shia school, some from the Sunni school. I don't think I see a single Christian in this majlis today. So what am I doing? Preaching to the converted? Is that what my job is? Is that my job? Preach to the converted? Those who already believe in Imam al Hussein? That's my job? At least bring one person from work to the majlis. Let them hear about what the true message of Al-Muhammad is. Bring a Hindu friend, bring a Sikh friend. I said, what's the point of Majalis? If Majalis are speaking to the same people, what are we changing? I agree with you. They'll go on YouTube and many people will come towards Islam and many people will change. But likewise, some of us have to change the fabric of our Majalis. Let the Jews and the Christians come and sit. Wallah, when they invite us, we run. But none of us bring them to our centers. Just one of your friends, bring him. And let him come and listen to the words of Ahlul Bayt. Number four, that the mosque should be a place for all cultures and not for one race. It's not a jama'at khana, ya habibi. It's not a jama'at khana. It's not a place just for one particular group. Yes. It's a place where white, black, multicolored, whatever background, Salman the Persian one side, and Bilal the Abyssinian another, Suhaib the Roman another, and they all were saying, La ilaha illallah. Correct? None of them were saying, This is our center. We base it on our kana. And that's the beauty of English majalis. No doubt. English majalis, what did it bring? Firstly, it showed the evolution of the majlis of Hussein. Anyone who claims a language on the majlis of Hussein in a mosque is someone who has not understood this religion. You know why? Because if the person who speaks Urdu tells me it should be Urdu, I'll be like, Well, I'm an Arab. Who said you should even have a chance? You come and teach me. You come and tell me that it should be in Urdu. I'm an Arab. Since when should Majlis al Hussein be in Urdu? The first Majlis was in Arabic. Listen, if we want to play that game, I can go destructive. Yes? But I'll stay to say 
The evolution of Hussein's message is not limited to a language. It is so every human being learns about Abu Abdullah. I'm an Arab, I don't care. I'm a lover of Abu Abdullah. I am a Urdu, Pakistani, Persian, Turkish. Allah wanted to make sure there was a hikmah. Hussein's message would go in every language one day, correct? When you have Majlis al Hussein today in English, look at the multicolored jama'a that you have. You, I can see in front of me Iraqis, I can see Lebanese, I can see Iranians, I can see brothers from Africa, I can see brothers from India, I can see brothers from Afghanistan, I can see brothers who are reverts, I can see every color because the language returned to a language which was a common denominator between all of us. Today when we are in Britain and you have someone emphasizing, you know but it's our mother tongue, Habib, I don't mind. A week is 168 hours. You talk with your son and daughter like a parrot for 167 in your language, leave one hour to me. Believe you me, my one hour with them will not change their language. Therefore you found that that was another area that Rasulullah did not want a community which is just insular, all seeing the same faces. Wallah, the more time you see the same faces, you'll pick a fight with them eventually, yes? See, husband and wife, see the same face, same face, same face. Absence makes the heart grow fonder when you miss him. Oh, I love you, come back. Likewise, in a community, wallah, if you see the same face every single week, every single week, those who are best friends eventually fight each other and so on. That's another area, Rasulullah opened, no racism, the mosque is for every color. Another area that bring the plethora of opinions between the different Muslims, I will not come and start banning Muslims from my community. Today, wherever I go in a mosque in the world, people come and ask me, should we ban this speaker or not? Should we ban him or not? Should we ban him or not? I'm like, why are you banning everybody? You know, what's going on? You're a banning machine or a taqwa machine? Yes, what are you? Said, oh, you know, at the end of the day, Habibi, listen, Rasulullah and his companions, amongst them, he had Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amongst them, he had Umar ibn al-Khattab. Amongst them, he had Amr ibn al-As. Amongst them, later on even, Khalid ibn al-Walid, Mughira ibn Shu'bah. Tell me, did the Prophet tell Umar ibn al-Khattab that you are banned from my mosque in Medina, get out? I defy anyone to show me that the Prophet told Umar, you are banned from the mosque in Medina, even when Umar called him delirious. Umar ibn al-Khattab, calls the Prophet delirious on his deathbed when he asks for a pen and paper and the Prophet does not ban him and now you come and start banning everybody who loves Muhammad and Al Muhammad how 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 either I follow the masjid of Rasulullah or I make up my own religion the Holy Prophet saw a plethora of opinions yes he made it clear for example I leave behind for you the Quran and my Ahlul Bayt that's clear enough or oh, Ali is to me like Harun is to Musa it's clear but even those who differed with him, never do you see Rasulullah turning around and say, that person, we ban him from the masjid because he has a difference with me. There were companions who questioned his prophethood on the day of Hudaybiyah, did not ban them. There were companions who called him delirious. There were companions who did not join Osama's army because they felt they were older than him. There were compan companions, all of these were doing all of this. Did the prophet turn around and ban? Today when I hear that there are mosques which are banning speakers, why? Why are you banning? Oh, because, you know, we're not sure about his belief. What, he is left 12th Imam? No, he does believe in the 12th Imam. Oh, why are you banning him then? Oh, because, oh, sorry, let me, let me ask you another question. Is it because he believes the Quran is not the book of God? No, no, he does. Oh, okay, he doesn't like Imam Hussein? No, he loves Imam Hussein. So what's your issue then? Oh, um, there's certain legal issues we have a difference of opinion on. Law is about linguistics precedent and the debate on language now you can differ in law from now until the day of judgment as long as the usul deen of the person is strong i'm not worried about anything else yes you come and tell me your moon is on this day my moon's on that day yeah, Habib, i'm not going to lose sleep over your moon yes you want to do Eid, do Eid. You don't want to do Eid, don't do Eid. Oh, I'm really worried about the unity of the Muslims because we're doing Eid on three different days. Go worry about the unity of your daughter's hijab first, then worry about the unity of the rest of the Ummah, yes? Or sometimes, no, go worry about the disunity between your children who don't pray Salah. One does, one doesn't, one does, one doesn't. And then come and tell me about disunity on the day of Eid. Or go and worry about the disunity of the way your wedding is and your son's wedding is and your daughter's wedding is before you come and tell me about, oh, I'm worried about disunity. Unity. If a person now wants to come and speak at our mosque, 
Let them come and let them have a commonsensical issue, which is what? Which is that when anyone comes to speak in the mosque, I can agree to agree or I can agree to disagree. I can say, listen, I agree with some of your opinions, but there's certain areas which I disagree with because I'm a pharmacy student far away from Islamic history or theology or law, but I still believe that I have absolute right to uh, say that I disagree with you even though I've read none of the books that you've ever read. So, you can have that if you want. There's no problem at all, but the reality is that when a person who wants to come and sit on our member, that person who's a lover of Al Muhammad, who's a lover of the Ahlul Bayt, he will come and sit here. If you have a difference of fiqh issues with him, sit with the person afterwards. Say, listen, this fiqh issue, can you explain it a bit further? Let's have open-mindedness in our mosques, like the open-mindedness that our Prophet built in his mosques. Otherwise, our kids will go to other religions because they'll feel they are more open-minded than our narrow-minded traditional establishments. Therefore, you found that the Prophet built his mosque in Medina. You could get married there. You had interfaith dialogue there. You were able to look after the homeless there. You were able to listen to plurality of opinion when it came to theology and ethics and law. And therefore, you find in the Muslim world, slowly there's evolution of such mosques within our communities. Believe you me, I see, for example, the Salam Center being built in North London. I see good work there. I see that Majalis of Ahlul Bayt will be held there. But I also see interfaith dialogue will be held there. Sports will be held there. That's an evolving place because I want my son, when he comes to the mosque, to be able to go swimming afterwards. Yes. My son might turn around and say, Dad, I'd love to go swimming in the gyms. But according to our ulama, the mixed pools are not allowed, for example, for a person to be in the mixed pool. Therefore, we build an extension swimming pool, a gymnasium for our daughters and our sons, pools for our daughters and our sons. And mind you, I do not look at what we have as a negative. Wallah, it's not, nothing is a negative. These mosques, were it not for the sweat of our fathers, we would never sit in a majlis today, believe you me. This is only a step for evolving. Not to look back at the past is negative. There are many youths who will turn around and say, I'm not coming to the mosque anymore because I don't have this. Don't. Listen, you look at what your father did. Your father was step one of the evolution. Now you're step two. Get your money out. Build a pool. Build a gym. Build a state-of-the-art area for people to study in the madrasa. You look at the new mosque that's being built in Orlando. Many of you have heard of the new mosque in Orlando now. The new mosque in Orlando, state of the art, resident Maulana residence, state of the art area for the madrasa and for people to study and learn, state of the art facilities within the mosque itself for people, non-Muslims to also come. You look at other mosques that are being built slowly and you see that there are many great examples in the school of Ahlul Bayt where people are evolving from just an Imam Barga, which was so needed by the way, now to being a multifaceted center where many of us can come. The Jewish community have a lovely, lovely center, which I have the utmost respect for, in Finchley Road, London. Finchley Road is one of the most prestigious areas in London, but the Jewish community have built the center. Believe you me, if you ever come out of Finchley Road Station, take a left, not the right towards the O2 center, take a left, walk up a little bit, look on the left at this wonderful glass building. Whatever you want to find, school, gym, cinema, fitness, education, all in one center in Finchley Road, yes? They teach you a lesson that they realized that maybe some of their sons and daughters were not coming to the synagogues because the synagogue was only giving lectures and namaz. So they started to put education, sports. You want to come, you want to have physical and spiritual vibrancy. That has to be the vision for the Shia for the 21st century. And that's the role of the youth, not the elders. The elders have given so much, now all of the youth have to be the ones who step up for the next 15 years and try and put this vision into place. Therefore, you found the religion of Islam focused on the importance of the mosque, and in particular, five mosques are more important than any other. Why? Because in Islamic law, there are five mosques where you are able to pray full or qasr when you're traveling. As you know, in Islam, if a person is traveling for a certain number of days, they have to pray what? They have to pray Qasr. If it exceeds a certain number of days, then it goes back to full. However, say these following places, if you are there even two or three days, you have the option of full or Qasr. Which ones? First of them, no doubt, is Masjid al-Haram. Yes, Masjid al-Haram, the sacred mosque. 
in Mecca, first place where you are able to pray full or qasr. Because those of you who will go to Hajj or Umrah, maybe you might come to someone and say, listen, can I pray full here? Or even though I'm on, yes, you can pray full. You can pray full even if it's two, three days. That's an option for Masjid al-Haram, number one. Number two, Masjid al-Nabawi in Medina. Yes, Masjid al-Nabawi, you have the option of full or the option of qasr. Number three, what else do you have? You have around and near the grave of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Yes, Imam al Hussein has certain features which are distinctive for him. First of them is that his clay cures sicknesses. Yes, if ever you have someone who is ill, you take them to the doctor. You've tried everything possible. Last thing, put that kaka shifa into the water and drink the water with full yaqeen that Abu Abdullah soil will look after you. And this is a hadith from the Imams that the soil of Karbala, that near the grave of Abu Abdullah, cures the sicknesses of those who have been sick. And believe you me, I've seen in my own eyes people who were told by doctors that they're going to die and they put a little bit of that soil, mixed it with the water and drunk it. Yes? And from that, they became cured once again. Try it. Do not leave it. Have yaqeen that Al Muhammad, whatever's around them, is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, the dua under the dome of Abi Abdullah is accepted straight away by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those of you who have hajat, may Allah allow you to go under the dome of Abi Abdullah. Sit there under the dome and reflect on the martyr of the 10th of Muharram. That's number two. You find likewise here that you can pray around near the grave, full or qasr is optional. Yes, that's in honor of Abu Abdullah. Number four, Masjid al-Sahla in Kufa. Masjid al-Sahla, the home of our 12th Imam upon his return, the home of many of the Imams, many of the prophets of Allah. Many of the opinions say it's called Sahla because the ease, Sahl is ease, the ease of which your dua is accepted by Allah in that mosque. And you find in that mosque you can pray full or you can pray qasar. Fifth, Masjid al-Kufa. Yes. Masjid al-Kufa, you have an option. You can pray full or you can pray qasar. Even if you're just a couple of days journey, you can pray full or you can pray qasar. Why? Because that Masjid al-Kufa is seen as one of the oldest mosques in the religion of Islam. Not just one of the eldest mosques. Ibrahim would pray there. And Khidr would pray there. And Musa would pray there. And you'd find that the Holy Prophet would come there. And others would come and pray there. But Masjid al-Kufa is also blessed. That within it, it's had some of the most memorable names. And some of the most memorable personalities. May Allah bless all of you one day that you are allowed to visit Masjid al-Kufa. And when he blesses all of you on that day, then you'll find that you walk straight to the front and you'll see a mihrab in Masjid al-Kufa. A mihrab which saw the blood gush from the head of Ali ibn Abi Talib on the night of the 19th of Ramadan. May Allah allow you to walk towards that mihrab. I beg you, <laughs> I beg you when you sit in that mihrab, I want you to remember a couple of things. How did it feel for Hussein when he held his father's head? Yes, that must have been difficult for him. When he held the head of his father and his father said to him, Hussein, is that you holding my head? He said to him, yes, my father it is. He said, you hold my head now, who will hold your head? <laughs> I also want you to remember another thing when you're in that mihrab. When Imam Ali was leaving the mihrab on that night, yes, when he was leaving, he had been struck. He was limping outside of that mosque. When he limped, he was limping, limping. Then when he got to the door of the mosque, he said to Imam Hassan and Imam al Hussein, let me walk straight, please help me. They said to him, Baba, why? Why do you want to walk straight? He said, I see Zainab at the door. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. I cannot bear to break Zainab's heart. <laughs> yes. I say to him, Ya Amir al muminin if you couldn't bear to break Zainab's heart, then what did Shimmer do to Zainab's heart? <clears throat> Therefore, when you're in Masjid al-Kufa, you'll go straight towards Imam Ali. You'll sit there. But then lean to the left if you can. Go to Hani bin Arwa. Yes? and sit by Hani's grave. Lean to the right and go to Mukhtar al thaqafi <laughs> <laughs> 
but don't leave Muslim bin Aqil abandoned like he was left in Kufa. <laughs> I beg you, don't leave Muslim bin Aqil's grave abandoned like he was left on the streets of Kufa. <laughs> Make time for Muslim bin Aqil. I beg you, make time for Muslim. No one made time for Muslim when he was left alone on the streets. <laughs> they dragged him in the streets of Kufa. <laughs> they, they ripped his body in that street. They took him to the top of the mosque, yes, to the top of the palace of Kufa. You'd think the man, when he's dying, would only think about himself. He says, send my salams to Abi Abdullah. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> because it pained Muslim that he couldn't help Abi Abdullah or warn him about what was happening. <laughs> When Imam al Hussein heard that Muslim had died, Imam al Hussein had to do something which he did many times go and tell the daughter that her father died. <laughs> Abi Abdullah began to walk towards the daughter of Muslim by the name of Hamida. Yes, sir. When he came towards Hamida, he patted her on the head and he said to her, My sons are like your brothers. Yes. And my daughters are like your sisters. She looked towards him and she said to him, Oh my uncle, have I become an orphan? Tell me. How does she know? She said to him, Uncle, when you pat the head of a girl, it means she's become a yeti. Do you know who came towards her? Sukaina came. She said to her, Hamida, do not worry. I'll look after you. I ask you, who looked after Sukaina after the death of Muharram? <laughs> if you had seen the way they slapped the eye of Sukaina, if you had seen the way they ripped the hijab of Sukaina, if you had seen the way Shimmer slapped the back of Sukaina, May Allah bless all of your tears. All of you have hajat tonight. I leave your hajat with you tonight. There are some of you who want your sons to be looked after. Your daughters, your wives, your families. One tear for Sukaina. One tear for Muslim. I'm going to leave you with this line. When they took Bibi Zainab and Um Kulthum through the streets of Kufa, many people were staring at the daughters. They were staring at the ladies. Sukaina would say, Auntie, why do they stare at us in this way? Yes. Then all of a sudden a lady came. Who was it? It was Tawa, the lady who had looked after Muslim bin Aqil when he was a stranger. <laughs> she came, she looked around, she said, where's Hamida, the daughter of Muslim bin Aqil? <laughs> They said to her, why? She said, I am Tawa. I looked after her father when he was alone. Where is she? I want to give her a message from her father. The poets say that the moment Hamida looked at her, she said to her the following lines. Before you give me my father's message, I want to ask you one thing. When my father fell from the castle, did anyone hold his body when he lay on the ground? <laughs> Did anyone look after him? Did anyone protect him? Did anyone bury him? Inna lillahu wa inna alayhi raja'u.